Big drop down there. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone at home. Thanks for having me. Do you know there are probably people in the room that have joined this church in the last year and never been in this place? So I can't encourage you to mingle now, but out there, do make people feel most welcome. Invite them to your gardens, get to know them. Take a look around. Here we are. At home, you can take a look around and look at the dining table. You can. Do you know what? We're here today in person for the second time in a year to celebrate God who reigns above all things. Amen? And maybe you, as you came in today, as you sat down, you went, ooh, ooh, there's something on my chair. And that's because Rebecca went, prayed for every chair before, before you came in. So that was just like a little dose of the Holy Spirit for you this morning as you sat down on your chair. It's like, ooh, thank you, Rebecca, for that. And I just want to take a moment to thank everybody who, over the last year, I mean, it's been a difficult year. We all acknowledge that. Um, but there have been so many people that have enabled us to continue to do church online. Obviously, at first, we were just finding our way um, kind of navigating in the dark a little bit. Um, and, but since then, we've, there's just been so many people that have helped. Rod right now is doing online hosting, so Rod's chatting to people at home over there. Um, and so if you're at home and you want prayer this morning, when you click request prayer, Rod is going to be praying with you. So do it all now. Everyone do it now and see, see Rod kind of fluster. <laughs> no. That's mean. Yeah, so thank, and Sunday Club as well. They've been awesome. They've been doing Zoom online for the kids every week. So should we just show our appreciation to the Sunday Club as well? It's a bit weird. I did this on camera for the first time a couple of weeks ago, and now there's 50-odd faces staring back at me. And I can't see you smiling, so you might just be frowning for all I know. No, thank you for your kindness and your forgiveness. Um, yeah, I mean, many people have, have lost loved ones over the last year. Many have suffered financially. Many have suffered with their mental health. Many have felt isolated, lonely. Many have struggled with homeschooling. Many people have had not just one, but two lockdown birthdays, all at the hands of COVID-19. But one thing I know now more than any other thing is that I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, and definitely not COVID-19 can keep us separate from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, who died to sin once and for all. And three days later, he rose in glory, overcoming death, that we may have a close and loving relationship with the Creator who knows each of us by name. Jesus is alive, and he's not helpless to help you see him today even in the midst of our ongoing struggles and battles. And earlier on, uh, Rebecca said, Lord, would you help us like, open the eyes of our hearts, Lord, to see you? And it's interesting, because a bit little later, um, that kind of comes into my talk a bit. So before we start, I just wanted to take a little look at Isaiah 40. Uh, it won't come up on the screen, because I haven't prompted the, uh, the team, but that's my fault, not theirs. Look up and see who created these. He brings out the stars by number and calls all of them by name. Because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. Jacob, why do you say, and Israel, why do you assert my way is hidden from the Lord and my claim is hidden by my God? As Leah read in John's accounts, Mary, who had just discovered that Jesus' body was gone, was in a similar place of distress. She was distressed at the fact that Jesus' body was gone. So much so that she didn't even recognize Jesus when he was standing before her. She thought he was the gardener. 
and ironically accused him of taking Jesus away. Then Jesus, the one who knows each of our names, says, Mary. And in that moment, she was known and her eyes were open to see Jesus resurrected and alive. Today, the Lord is calling your name and I pray too that your eyes would be open to see the Lord Jesus in our midst. Whatever you're facing, perhaps you've had a great weekend, restrictions have been lifted, the sun's been out, you're feeling optimistic about everything, you think everything's gonna be okay. Making up for a bit of lost time. Or perhaps some of you, perhaps you're scared and anxious about the reality of re-entering into a society that has changed so much in the last 12 months. And the fact is you want to feel excited, but the reality is it's a bit overwhelming, the prospect of having to kind of get back to some sort of normality. Wherever you are right now, Jesus is calling your name and wants to reveal himself to you. So as we begin today, why don't we pray together? Lord, we thank you that you know each of us by name. And because of your power, the same power that overcame death, and raise Jesus to life, that we may be known by you more intimately than any other, that we can trust that we are right where you have placed us to be, not one of us is missing. So Father, I pray as we pause now, would you call each person here, each person watching online at home, and each person that might be watching this back, I pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts to see you afresh this morning, the risen Lord Jesus. Amen. Quite apt that I'm drinking from the font. <laughs> Just me. It's probably heretical. Oh no, help. We're going to need this to be lighthearted today, folks. So a little chuckle every now and then if I laugh is much helped. No. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Okay. Okay, so over the last few days, uh, we've joined together to read the accounts of Jesus' um, Last Supper, uh, his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, and today we read of his glorious resurrection from the dead. Amen. But Jesus wasn't, he was quite busy during his time in the grave, okay? Saturday wasn't like a, a, a down day for Jesus. Um, it says in the Apostles' Creed about Jesus that he descended to the dead before rising again on the third day. In Revelation 1, we're told that Jesus now holds the keys to death and Hades. It's quite miraculous what Jesus achieved in just a few days. On Good Friday, he's rejected by his closest friends, arrested, judged innocent, and then condemned to death by popular demand. He then takes our sin and our uncleanness, and the sin and uncleanness of all those who'd rejected him upon himself whilst dying an excruciating death. And as if that wasn't enough, during his time in the grave, he went, he took the keys of death. And then once he had the keys, death couldn't hold him anymore, and so he rose in glorious life. And those of us too that choose him we get to die to our sins with him and also be resurrected to eternal life with and in him. So just a casual weekend for Jesus then. He didn't do, you know, sun was shining, had some fun. No, he was a busy guy. <laughs> uh, never called Jesus a busy guy before, that's funny. No? It's just the nerves that are making me do these odd things, don't worry. Okay, after Jesus uh, rose from the dead, he appeared to his disciples, and it's that that we're gonna have a little look at today. So we haven't really even started to talk yet, and you're thinking, when can I get home for my roast? So let's read together from John 20. Uh, it's just a few verses, 19 to 22. When it was evening on the first day of the week, the disciples were gathered with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. Jesus came, he stood among them, and said to them, peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side, so the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. 
three seems to be quite an apt number for Easter, so I've prepared three things uh, for us to have a little think about today. Okay, number one, the disciples were locked away because they were probably freaking out a little bit, fear, fearing for their lives. Their leader, who they just thought had come to sort out all this mess, as we looked at um, the other day, had been crucified as a threat to the crown, and then he comes and stands among them. Comes and stands, just appears among them. And so now I'd like to show you a little video. You're probably all aware by now that I've been getting into space quite a lot recently, and I'm kind of shoehorning as many space references into my talks. Well, I've done two talks so far, so there's been two space references, but there might be more to come in the future. Anyway, so, and I've been following quite particularly the Mars Perseverance rover, and I don't know if anyone else has, but it's pretty cool. This is a bit of a tenuous connection, but I think it, I thought I'd show it to you because it saves me quacking on and on for so long. So, we've got a couple of minutes. This is footage of the Mars Perseverance lander, landing rover landing on Mars. Let's take a look. Up and fly right maneuver, where the spacecraft will jettison the entry. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Applicate in the cage, shoot deploy. The navigation has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 480 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Heat shield set. Perseverance is now slowed to subsonic speeds and the heat shield has been separated. This allows both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second at an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. Nav filter converge. Velocity solution 3.3 meters per second. Altitude 7.4 kilometers. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 .6 kilometers of the surface. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain relative navigation and subsequently the priming of the landing engines. Our current velocity is about 90 meters per second at an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. OVS valid. We have confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution and part of terrain relative navigation. Priming. PBA is nominal. We have priming of the landing engines. Back shell set. Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers from the surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. Starts getting good now if you've fallen asleep. Start we have started watching. our constant velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. Sky crane maneuver has started, about 20 meters off the surface. We're getting signals from MRO. Tango Delta. Touchdown confirmed. Perseverance safely on the surface of Mars, ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. <laughs> oh, yes. I, don't, I get little tingly feelings just like watching that, right? It's crazy. Right, where was I? Here we go. Okay. So what we saw in that video was the parachutes being released after the entry capsule that was holding the Mars rover had come through the Martian atmosphere, 
Then the heat shield was jettisoned, which was that kind of disk thing that flew off, and then we could see the surface of Mars. It was, I think it probably would have been clearer on the side screens. Uh, we could see the surface of Mars. Then the back shell with the parachutes were released, okay? And then the landing module, which was the thing that we, as they were lowering the rover, was on the top left, and you could see it kind of hovering, and it looked like it kind of had rockets coming out the side. Um, that thing comes out, it gets radar lock on the ground, and they're all really excited about radar lock. Did you notice that? It was like, we've got radar lock, and they're like, yeah, we got radar lock, USA, USA, things like that. It was really exciting. Then it scans the ground. It finds a suitable place to plop down the, uh, to <laughs> plop down, to put the rover down. Then it makes some adjustments. And then it performs that sky, what they call the sky crane maneuver, where the, the landing module kind of lowers perseverance to the surface of Mars. And then when it's got touched down, uh, the, the landing module releases and flies off and has a uncontrolled landing. It crashes. It blew my mind when I watched that live. I think I watched that just after like a, an encounter night or something. Um, Wilf and I we were watching it. It was, it was brilliant. Two things that blew my mind. One, all of that happened fully autonomously. No one was in control of it. The spacecraft was following a program that had been set before it left Earth. And it made its own decisions along the way. It's got some crazy AI stuff in there. It, made, it, kind of, it looked at the ground and went, oh, there's some rocks there. There's a mountain there. So I'm going to pop the rover down there and then, just, and then did it. The second thing is that it did it all. We got to see that. It all happened fully blind. So in, in the control center, all, they didn't have any cameras. The images came about five days later, came back from Mars. Um, all they had was strings of ones and zeros just telling the, the the rover was basically just telling them what was going on. And so they were, having, they were just like listening to these sounds and watching this data come in. And they were getting really excited, like all these ones and zeros coming in. Um, and it's just, it just blew my mind. And then the videos came back, and this was released. Uh, and it's just, I just think it's crazy. It took 11 years in the making. It took seven months for, the, for it to get to Mars. And now you're thinking, wow, Tim, this is really, really exciting, isn't it? But what's it got to do with Jesus appearing to the disciples? And it's kind of exactly that. I did tell you it was a bit tenuous. NASA spent billions of dollars with some of the brainiest people getting that rover up there. And Jesus just appeared to his disciples. And I think if it was his prerogative, he could have just appeared on Mars as well. That's how tenuous it is. But it's in there. The point is that the resurrected Lord Jesus can go places and do things that we can't do. He can enter into places in our lives that no doctor, no counselor, no husband, no wife can go. The most complicated and intimate parts of our lives are familiar to God. Remember, he formed you and he knows you and he calls you by name. In the instance in John 20, as we've read, he entered into the disciples' moment of fear he comes close and he assures them of the hope and the peace that they have and he guides them in the way to go. He's not a distant, angry God who watches us struggling from afar before entering in. He doesn't watch from afar and say, oh, I'll just wait for them to have a little bit more faith, wait for them to get their act together and then I'll enter in. He enters into the place of fear and despair. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing, and it's significant, he says, peace be with you, twice. And I'm pleased to say in this section, I don't have any videos of spacecraft landing. You'd be pleased to hear, that's good. But I can really recommend a good talk on peace called the Passover DMC. Okay, you can catch it on our YouTube channel. Um, it's really, really quite cracking. Now, <laughs> thanks, Kat. Now, if I were a disciple fearing for my life, then all of a sudden Jesus appears, I wouldn't be thinking, oh good, Jesus has appeared, everything's gonna be okay. I'd be thinking, oh my goodness, Jesus has come to get his own back. It's quite staggering that the first thing that Jesus says 
when he pays a visit to the disciples that not 72 hours before have deserted and abandoned him, he can, he can say, peace be with you. How can, he say, how can he say this? Well, he can say this because the sins and transgressions of the disciples towards Jesus and God were covered by the blood of Jesus, the lamb who was slain. The disciples are freaking out. And it would seem like they haven't cottoned on yet that in Jesus' death and resurrection, everything had changed. From this moment on, the world would never be the same again. Notice how the text doesn't say, Jesus said, peace be with you, and then the disciples stopped fearing. No, because as we looked at a few weeks ago, peace, the peace that Jesus made on the cross doesn't always mean an absence of struggle, an absence of fear, an absence of despair. God's peace is about hope. And although for us now, we know the eternal life that comes from giving our yes to Jesus, the disciples were not necessarily aware of this hope yet. In our book club last year, we re uh, read John Ortberg's Who Is This Man? And in preparing this talk today, I was reminded of his book. Of Easter Sunday, he, he says, Sunday changed everything, but not in the way that many people think. From our point of view, 2,000 years later, many people think of Easter as a comforting story that says spring is coming, Flowers are blooming, life is eternal, everything's going to work out. He continues a page or so later. What got released on Sunday was hope. Not hoping that life would turn out well, not even a hope that there would be life after death. Hope that called people to die. Die to selfishness and sin and fear and greed. Die to the lesser life of the lesser self so that a greater self might be born. We read from Romans 6 on Friday, which unpacks a little, this a little more, so I'd encourage you to go back and reread this again when you've got some time. Jesus invites all people into the peace that he made upon the cross. And for those who believe and want to receive, all we have to do is say sorry, thank you, and please. Lord, I'm sorry about how I thought life was all about me. I'm sorry for rejecting you, pushing you away, and doing things in my life which don't honor and please you. Thank you, Lord, that you sent Jesus, your one and only son, to die for me, to take my sin upon himself and make me clean in your eyes. Lord, please come into my life and be my God, my savior, my king. From this day forward, my life is yours. If you'd like to pray that prayer, or perhaps you just did, then I'd encourage you to tell someone. If you're in the room, you can tell a neighbor. If you're online, watching live, you can request prayer and tell Rod. And if you're watching back, why don't you get in touch with us via our website or social media. Okay, thirdly and lastly, Jesus, in our passage, commissions his disciples. The Great Commission is accounted quite differently in each of the Gospels. However, in our text here in John 20, what we might just think is coincidental, I think has real significance. Remember it said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I, am also, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Jesus had made peace with his disciples and he commissions them to go and live in the world like he did. Go and be like me. Just as the Father has sent me into the world with a plan for redemption, I'm sending you to continue this work. Other accounts of the Great Commission say, go and make disciples of all nations or go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. As an aside, if you needed an excuse to speak to animals and inanimate objects, there it is. Just this last Thursday, during the final session of our prayer course, one of my group explains how they keep praying to God that, that he would help them to, to, and show them someone that they could share the gospel with. But when they, when they do, the good news seems to fall on deaf ears. It seems like in the West now, we live in what John Marcoma would call a post-Christian society. That is a society that 
has heard the news of the life that Jesus offers and doesn't just bear with it, even though they might not believe it, they outright reject Jesus. They outright reject Jesus and oppose his teaching. And in a society like this, no amount of Bible bashing, no amount of ramming the gospels down people's throats is going to open their eyes to Jesus. It's not gonna work. So what then? Where does that leave us? Well, be like Jesus. Be like Jesus. Love the last, the least, and the lost. Seek the peace and welfare of the city. Pray without ceasing. Remain in him. Let him lead you beside still waters. Surrender your life to God's will each and every day until you are with him. Then join the eternal song of heaven forevermore. But notice after Jesus commissions them, he didn't just then like unlock the door and boot them out and be like, on you go. No. He breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, some of you might be thinking, hang on a minute. I know my Bible. I know my... Isn't the Holy Spirit poured out at Pentecost like a few weeks later? And you'd be right. This is, uh, having looked into this in preparation for the talk is a point of some debate and I'm not gonna sort of tell you which is right or wrong. I'll let you do that. Uh, some people use Corinthians 12, which says there are different kinds of gifts but the same spirit distributes them to reconcile this kind of seeming in incompatibility between the two accounts um, of the Holy Spirit being sent. This would suggest, if we, if we use the Corinthians text, it would suggest that the Holy Spirit was in fact given to the disciples at this point, but in just a different way to as it was given at Pentecost, perhaps. Others would suggest that um, this was more of a kind of a dramatic object lesson that Jesus said to help prepare the disciples to be completely filled at Pentecost. More of a, <sighs> receive the Holy Spirit when it comes kind of thing. <laughs> I'll leave you to look into that and to decide which side of the fence you're gonna sit on because for us today, it's not really important. What is important is that in order to go and be like Jesus in the world, we're certainly gonna need his Holy Spirit in order to do it, which is why Jesus doesn't just unlock the door and boot them out, but he equips them with the Holy Spirit. In Acts 1, it says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And it's a good job because without his power, we wouldn't stand a chance to live like him in the world. Without the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we'd be surely given in to selfishness, jealousy, anger, hatred, immorality, drunkenness, the list goes on. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to be people of the fruit of the Spirit, people like Jesus, of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Only in his power do we stand a chance of fulfilling the Great Commission. And his power is given to us through the Holy Spirit, which is made possible by the cross. You remember back on Friday, we read about the veil being torn in, in the temple at the point of Jesus' death. Because Jesus took our uncleanness on himself and made us clean in God's sight, there is no, no longer any need for the veil of separation between us and God. And because of that, we can know God. We can have God in us. Because we are clean, we can have God in here. We can have the Holy Spirit living in us and the power of the Holy Spirit working through us. So go, go, be like Jesus in the world. Go and make disciples of all nations. Go and be salt and light. But wait, before you go, that significant thing I, want, I mentioned back at the beginning, we have to get the order right here. First, peace be with you. Get yourself right with Jesus. No amount of power, no amount of purpose and calling, can lead you into God's peace. Give Jesus your yes, die to yourself, and go on giving him your yes each and every day. Hear what he's calling you to do, 
the purpose that he has for your life and receive the Holy Spirit that will equip you for every good work. Now go. Now go. No, you want to stay? Okay. So what's our response today? What's our response to what we've heard? Well, I think, I don't want to overcomplicate it. I think it's quite simple. For some of us, maybe not in the room, but maybe uh, some people watching this online or watching this back, we need to give our yes to Jesus for the very first time. And others, we may have given our lives to Jesus, but we need to come to a place of surrender once more. We need to come to a point of surrender once more in our lives. Others may be asking the Lord, well, what would you have me do? What's my purpose? And are seeking God's voice for guidance in their lives. Or perhaps apathy has got the better of you. Your life is surrendered to Jesus. You have a clear understanding of what he's called you to do, he's called you into, and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, yet you failed to go. Then today we want to commission you to go to go and be like Jesus. I'm gonna invite Rebecca to come up and lead us in response. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks so much, Tim, for bringing us good news again. So there are a number of different ways that we could respond depending on what God is doing in your heart, what is he bringing to your attention today? So for some of us, it might be, actually, I've never made peace with God. I've never accepted that invitation to be forgiven, to make Jesus the king and the master of my life, to actually be welcomed back into his family as a dearly beloved child. And so if that is you, we would love you to click the request prayer button um, and connect with us. Um, if you're in the room, then we would um, love to also be able to connect with you. Maybe for those of us who have prayed that prayer, it's a matter of, oh God, I just, I need to remember that. I need to surrender to you again. For others, that sense of peace in our purpose. For others, a resurrection oomph <laughs> out of apathy, being filled with the Holy Spirit. And maybe for others, it's a thing of actually, I'm still waiting for Jesus to appear. The disciples had forgotten that he was gonna rise again. I hadn't really understood it. And then bam, he suddenly shows up. And so I want to encourage us, that's what he does, he shows up. So I just declare, particularly over those of you who are waiting for Jesus to show up, he's coming. He's coming to bring life, he's coming to bring hope, he is coming to shift things. He appears. So I'm gonna pray for us um, just as we um, come to the end of our service, we'll then have one final song um, and be spending time with Jesus today. It's all about him. So let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for your love for us and for dying on the cross that we would be forgiven that we would be restored back into relationship with you and we would be filled again with your spirit and your love. I pray for those who don't yet um, know that relationship with you, God, that you would give them courage to surrender and actually to find that that's where the place of life begins. Lord, for those who need to surrender again, make it all about you. I pray for the grace and the power to do that and your Holy Spirit to enable them to continue. Lord, for those who are looking for peace in purpose, ask for an anointing of peace that passes all understanding, that you would open eyes of our hearts to see you and to see what we're called to. 
And Lord, for those of us who have become apathetic, that we know we are called to go, would you come and encounter us again with your goodness? Would you come and fill us to overflowing with all that you are, that it would just be a natural overflow? We ask that you would draw us this week, this year, into the more that you have for us. And I thank you that you're gonna show up because you are faithful. In Jesus' name, amen.